Um, as many of you in this room have uh, probably done before, I did not set out on my Nuffield journey with the intention of studying online sales or digital strategy, nor did I intend to present on digital strategy following a keynote speaker whose job title is digital strategist. But the light bulb moment for me was the second week of my GFP, uh, travelling around uh, China, rural China, and stumbling into a rural market um, in what was considered very, uh, very rural, with uh, t only two million people, um, and going up to buy some produce with a stack of Chinese yuan, and having the vendor basically wave off my cash as as not good, not good here. Um, and so this was this was the market. Um, and as you can see, probably what we saw a bit last night is there's a few other barcodes and, and sort of things that were, were the preferred method of payment. Um, finally, after a bit of a convincing, we could uh, pay via cash, but that was going to cost us about 15% more. Um, so luckily we had a host there who, who ended up paying, paying for it uh, through there. What that is is WeChat, which is a mobile payment system, um, saving us some money. So the purpose of my presentation is to provide a summary of my Nuffield uh, in 15 minutes, including an overview of online selling, how it is disrupting traditional food supply chains, and what the New Zealand agri-food sector needs to do to ensure we stay relevant. We've heard lots over the last two days around the environment and social impact of our food production, and I have the privilege of addressing an economic factor that will hopefully provide the platform to market the good work around the environment and social issues that many of my fellow scholars have covered off. I'll firstly cover off why a self-confessed tech dummy chose this particular topic, then what some of the insights were from my travels, and finally how New Zealand can utilise these insights to create a winning online strategy. So until my light bulb moment of GFP, I was still broadly looking at my original topic on how New Zealand was selling its food products and interacting with its customers from a relationship point of view. This quote here resonated with me and sums up my initial strategy. So if you travel on a theme, the theme has to develop with the travel, and at the beginning your interests can be very broad and scattered, which mine were, and then they must get more focused. So my light bulb moment provided me with that, that focus. So after receiving my Nuffield Scholarship in 2016, uh, the 2016 agenda from KPMG had this, uh, this page in it. And it showed the estimated value of our products that we sold, what they were selling for in the, in the final market. So this, for me, you know, 37 billion then turning into over 250 billion. You know, it created some questions for me. It was, you know, is it possible for us to get more of this pie and how that would happen? Um, so I started to look initially at how New Zealand was selling its food products around the world and ask, you know, could we move up the value chain? You know, why have we focused on the commodity space? And what can we control in this chain and what is, what is basically out of our hands? My light bulb moment, or burning platform as we've heard over the last few days, provided me with a topic area that needed more investigating and provided me with my focus. So what insights did I find about online selling and the opportunity to New Zealand? Firstly, as I've already mentioned, mobile payment systems. So while globally credit cards still make up the majority of, majority of transactions with online payments, you know, that is skewed by the Western culture that requires items now and paying for it later. So in China and particularly Southeast Asia, where a lot of people don't even have bank accounts, let alone credit cards, the fastest, move, the fastest growing payment system is, is mobile, peer-to-peer -peer lending, um, Alipay, WeChat, those sorts of things through mobile devices. So, you know, while in New Zealand we, we traditionally uh, basically aiming to be a cash society. You know, any new technology that gets brought out, um, like credit cards, like PayWave, um, the banks stick a, an additional margin, usually around 25 to 3%, um, and this basically gets added on, you know, by the, the, the retail space to the consumer, or, you know, if you pay by that, you pay it then. Um, so, we, you know, this is in contrast to, to China and, and 
Southeast Asia, as I mentioned you know, in, my, in my story, they're offering discounts basically on the food. A, the vendor gets a signing bonus, um, and it's cheaper to use the peer-to-peer -peer lending, and literally overnight, two million people will then start using that technology because it is, is cheaper. So there's a lot New Zealand can potentially learn, learn from that and bringing in that new technology. The second uh, major insight I had was around mobile selling. Um, and the, I guess the, the penetration of mobile um, as, a, as a sales tool. So the fastest growing sales channel worldwide uh, with double digit percentage growth the last two years and fueled by these online payments is, is the mobile device. So globally around 34% of people will buy, if they're shopping online, will predominantly use their mobile phone. Um, but as you can see from this slide, that's even higher in, in many developing uh, markets in China, India, and Southeast Asia. Um, three out of four smartphone users, and I imagine there's plenty in this room, have act worldwide have actually purchased something on their phone. So the second insight, and I was talking about this at the table uh, just before coming up actually, is the, the rebirth of the, the bricks and mortar retail space uh, for, for online players. So this is probably the biggest observation I had from my travels was the number of pure online e-commerce players, your Alibabas, your Amazons, that were making moves offline in the retail space. These retail stores they're not being used to sell products like traditional retail stores that we're used to in New Zealand. These retail stores are where consumers come and often try products, learn how to cook them properly so they don't have a bad experience at home. Um, they're similar to trade shows, they have new product launches um, and often they won't take anything home after they leave these stores. They'll then go and buy that online. And the main reason for looking at that is the way that consumers and this is um, have have changed their, their buying journey. So previously, awareness was created through TV and, and print. Consideration was often word to mouth, talking to friends about products. Evaluation was done in store. Purchase was done in store. And consuming and repeating was done in store. And finally, again, word of mouth in terms of um, you know, whether that was a good product or not. Where we are now is awareness is online, usually on a mobile phone through social media, Instagram, um, following Instagram stars, they're promoting products. Consideration is actually done now with a mix of on the mobile and in these, these pop-up stores or stores. Um, the evaluation of the products done in that store, you know, how it tastes, how, how to cook it, but the purchasing's then done on the mobile phone. The repeating of that product's then done on the mobile phone. So, phone, so many customers buying a new product would only visit the store potentially once and then they'll do everything on the phone after that. And then again, the advocacy is still word of mouth, but it's just a different platform on a mobile phone. One of the other observations was, you know, a huge shift in what I guess you call the monopolies. Um, so these are, this is sort of the battle that everyone hears about, Amazon versus Alibaba. Two big players um, literally buying up buying up everything and competing in markets. Um, you know, we've heard a lot about raising capital around alternative proteins. These two uh, businesses have no shortage of, of capital available them, to them to make their next move. So something that New Zealand needs to be aware, aware of in terms of how we're dealing with these businesses. Uh, this is before leaving New Zealand, um, as most Nuffielders probably do, we do a bit of a tour around, uh, talk to a few companies in New Zealand. And the, the common perception I got coming back from the odd travel was that the business to, we're largely in the business to business space. And e-commerce or mobile selling is more considered in New Zealand to be business to consumer, so direct to the consumer. But what I found was the consumerization of business to business. So all of these, you know, all of these business to business uh, companies are gonna be run by millennials, and Generation Z or the iBrains who have literally lived their whole lives um, immersed in mobile technology and mobile phones. So they will be expecting to be able to do the same things in their place of work as they do in their, in their personal life. So you've seen a huge shift of these businesses now wanting to deal rather than face to face, they want to deal and make their purchases over a mobile phone. 
Obviously, the, the sites or the platforms are going to be a lot different. Um, business to business requires, you know, it's not an emotional decision like it is business to consumer. It's very much going to be more of a, a financial and a business decision, and there's going to be more people involved. So you need to be able to have more people buying from the same, same site. And one thing I picked up the New Zealand businesses needed to work on with their platforms is um, many, many companies thought that you know, it was great to advertise products on these sites, um, but you know, get in touch if you want to make a purchase and we can, we can tee up a meeting. These businesses don't want that extra step. They are just as time poor as, the, as consumers and they want to be able to make that purchase and have that payment on, on that site. So it's not replacing face-to-face -face selling for those that are you know, looking at those traditional markets. It's just uh, you know, making it more accessible. Um, and face-to-face -face is still particularly important, but probably more at the initial buying stage and it's more the follow-up uh, sales are going to be done via the online markets. And many people don't actually realise that Alibaba Group, their initial website, alibaba.com, was actually a business-to-business -business marketplace, not, had nothing to do with consumers. So in terms of my recommendations, um, the first one you know, for New Zealand primary and food producers is your, your platform or your website needs to be mobile first. <laughs> Many companies uh, I met with, and one in particular, HMC Fruit in California, uh, they had failed at their online play because their websites were set up to work on a desktop computer. Now, while we have, might have a lot of desktop computers and laptops in this room, um, overseas, most countries and developing countries have skipped them completely. They've gone straight to the mobile phone because basically that is a computer in your pocket. So HMC Fruit, they were an interesting story. Their two major markets were uh, LA and San Fran, which is obviously uh, pretty you know, techn technology advanced in terms of how they're dealing with things, and they really missed the boat there in terms of their platform, and it turned a lot of people off. This is a quote I've probably created, is, is something that New Zealand businesses need to, need to realise, is every business-to-business -business customer is also a business-to-consumer customer as well. So that's something to keep in mind. And we need to be thinking business to all. We need to be targeting you know, the younger generation, um, and you know, they're going to be the, the majority consumer by 2030 and the majority business owner by probably 2040. Uh, so last night we looked at a bit of uh, blockchain. Um, so I won't get too much into that. We got a pretty good overview last night. But this is just an example of some of the new technologies available that New Zealand companies really need to start using um, when selling our food. So this is in, uh, in China. This is run by JD.com, who's a, an online mainly player. Um, and as you can see, this is a beef out of uh, Inner Mongolia. And on that product, you're scanning that barcode and it's coming to, you learn a little bit about that farm. So what that's saying, is what that, who that farmer is, where that farm is, um, when that animal was born, what that animal's been fed, in this case grain and lucerne, um, what, that, what treatments that animal's had from a vet or what treatments that farmer's purchased, when that animal left the farm, what time it was killed, um, what part of the animal you're eating, and um, you know, basically, you know, as we heard last night, how long that animal's been outside. So there's huge opportunity and upside there for New Zealand businesses because you could have, for example, a grass-fed New Zealand free-range beef animal from David Kidd's property um, that you know, hasn't had any antibiotics and has you know, been fed grass its whole life. So there's huge opportunity there to, to market. And believe it or not, while we don't use QR codes in New Zealand or Western cultures, in China they very much scan those products. And this is a quick example of some of the QR codes that Fonterra is using. So it's a really a good step in the right process around building that uh, trust and then that authenticity. Uh, but there's huge opportunity to go further than just a bit of, bit of jargon there and making sure it's in the right language uh, for the country it's been sold into. Uh, landing pads was another one. Um, you know, in terms of that retail space, that's something New Zealand doesn't have is retail space in, in markets. Um, so, you know, having at the moment we've got landing pads set up to meet people face to face. Let's make these landing pads a bit more exciting. Have a few products with barcodes that we can scan back to where you can find that product online, um, and we could work in with other organisations like Tourism New Zealand, um, who are then, you know, having uh, 
you know, Blue Duck Station, for example, coming all the way, you know, all the way back the other way um, and attracting those consumers. And finally, um, you know, in terms of leveraging the dominant players in the market, there's a number of huge players we all know about and a lot of New Zealand companies starting to sell on these products, uh, on these sites. But what I did find out was, you know, we don't want to put all our offering on these sites. Um, we want to make sure that the customer's got a relationship with New Zealand um, and the producer and not with Alibaba or Amazon because at the moment those, those consumers, all they know is Amazon. They buy their meat from Amazon. They buy their meat, uh, milk from Alibaba. They don't know where it's coming from as much as, as they should. So we need to make sure we have that, um, I guess, you know, that relationship. So New Zealanders and particularly the rural community are very conservative by nature and that has led many... Um, as many previous scholars have pointed out to us dealing largely in the commodity space. This space is where there's a lot of buyers and sellers, which has suited New Zealand, as it means it's easier for us to find a home for our products. And even though we're exposed to market fluctuations, most of the time we get our products sold, just not always at the price we want. However, this space is always going to be stacked in the favour of the buyers, as there is more choice for businesses and consumers and more competition for New Zealand. We've avoided these niche or edges of this space because there's higher risk and it's traditionally been harder to find these consumers or businesses who will pay the premium for grass-fed or free-range. Online selling provides the opportunity um, you know, for us to link in and, and connect with these consumers. Not finding these consumers in the past has meant, you know, for, particularly for co-ops, the risk of, of failure um, and shareholders who potentially want directors' heads. Fear of failure and capital has driven us to take the safe commodity option time and time again. In summary, mobile commerce is disrupting traditional supply chains faster than seen before. As we move into the future, both business customers and consumers will be made up of millennials and Generation Z who have lived their whole lives in the smartphone era. We need to pay attention to these eye brains and embrace new sales technology for our food products if we are to achieve our goal of becoming a premium food producer. The future is no longer in our hands, it's in our mobile phones. Thank you.